Thank you so much. Thanks uh, for the big audience here. I'm super excited um, to tell you a little bit about the big data integration patterns that we came up at ResearchGate. ResearchGate is a professional network for scientists, and um, we, uh, we, we, ResearchGate is built for scientists and gives them the tools to connect, to collaborate, and to discover relevant research. Um, we have um, um, our mission is um, to connect the world of science and really make research open to all, make all the research artifacts accessible. And so far, we have 12 million scientists who are registered users for ResearchGate, and our database contains more than 100 million publications. And so far, we have discovered more than 1.5 billion citations that connect those publications. So a big part of what we are doing is finding those connections, be it connections between publications, between users, between research topics. Um, that's, that's what we are doing, and that means big data processes in, Big data processing is a large part of it, analyzing that scientific content, and then in the end, making good recommendations to our users. For that, uh, we started pretty early with um, doing um, Hadoop and other big data processing, and um, we run two Hadoop clusters in production, one which we call the live cluster, the near real-time cluster, uh, which is optimized for latency and mainly ran, uh, running HBase and Flink streaming. And we have the batch cluster, so-called analytics cluster, which mainly runs MapReduce, Hive, and Flink batch. And both of these clusters are in the petabyte range. So when we're talking about those applications, so what we are doing, we are running over 3,000 yarn applications on a normal day. Roughly 70% of them are scheduled um, um, uh, applications that run every day, and roughly 30% are interactive ad hoc analyses. And we do ingest more than 370 different data sources every day. And we're 65 engineers, and that is everyone from front end to system operations. And this means a lot of jobs, quite a few engineers, but this is still an amazing amount of work. So what we think a lot about is developer productivity. So we want it to be fun to develop new jobs. You should get your results quickly. But it should also be fun to upgrade the job later when you want to build a new feature for it. So ease of maintenance is very important and ease of operations because no one wants to get uh, woken up and uh, wants to get uh, called at night if one of those 3,000 jobs might have a hiccup. So we come up with some integration patterns and principles, how we build our workflows. And they are all about productivity, about easy collaboration between teams, basically coming up with building blocks that make it really easy and fun to build bigger systems out of it. So speaking of reuse, and developers should be able to reuse results from everywhere, from other teams, be it software or be it data. Yeah, these patterns though, of course, they need to be strategic, but they should really be driven by real-world use cases. And they should really be driven by real-world pain points. This is what you want to solve with them, because that is what then developer productivity is about. And they should not be dictated by a single technology. So we try to focus on by, with these principles on more the abstract level and really think about what's the idea behind it and not go too much into like, how do we do this with this specific framework? And why is it so big data is still a fast moving space? Like big data batch processing today is quite different to compare to five years ago. And five years ago, 2012, I still remember, it was my first time to attend um, uh, Buzzwords as a guest, and I still can vividly recall the discussions that we were having. So there was, hey, should we use Hive or should we use Pig, for example? Or should we use HBase coprocessors? Or it was, hey, what is the best client library to talk to Zookeeper with? And that's not questions that keep us awake at night today. So this whole space has evolved quickly. So many new frameworks have happened. And um, we are in a quite different world today than it was five years ago. And while the batch processing world is slowly 
uh, maturing and um, the, the speed of innovation goes a little bit down. With the stream processing world, it's, we're still in the middle of it. This is what's happening right now. This is really exciting. And what's happening today with streams um, will probably um, influence, for example, SQL on streams will influence what, how, what we will run um, on top of stream processors instead of batch processors for the upcoming years. So this is uh, evolving, and that means the big data architecture also must evolve over time. So as I said, um, we wanted it to be use case driven. And that's why I want to very quickly tell you about our first big data use case that we had. Early 2011, we implemented author analysis on Hadoop. Back in the day, that was Java MapReduce because few options available. And since then, early 2011, we're running Hadoop in production. The problem is easily described. You have two publications. And imagine that both publications have a common author. In this case, for example, Iyad Madish. And you want to know, is this the same person? Or are these two different people who just coincidentally share the same name? So this is kind of a clustering problem, a classification problem, author name disambiguation problem, all rolled up into one. And it has super high product impact. It's a user-facing feature, because if we find this out correctly, then we can build beautiful publication detail pages where we connect the scientific content directly to the users who created it. So. One thing that's maybe a bit different from other first use cases with Hadoop is that we are talking about enriching user-generated content. So the users are creating those publications, and we want to enrich them with some information, so they're both working on the same data set. And that's a little bit different from an analytical use case. If you would have an analytical use case, you would start with users producing some data in your live database. You would ingest that to your Hadoop cluster. Then you would run some analytics on it, and that would, uh, in the result, go, for example, to your BI tool. Or if you're, for example, building a recommendation model, then again, the users would click on your site. You would um, uh, record interesting signals on the live database. And you would uh, ingest these data, ingest the signals and features, build a recommendations model in Hadoop, for example, ship that model off again to production. But it's not going to the same live database. It's sitting next to it. Right? That was a little bit of a special thing that we had to do there. Very quickly about the data model. So this is just a small part of the data model at ResearchGate. And what we are talking about, basically, is the connection here between publications, authors, and accounts. And these live in and are owned by different microservices, which means um, our first implementation looked a little bit like this. You have data owned by different microservices. And we are ingesting that, and we are doing author analysis. I'm cheating a little bit here. This is an oversimplified representation. What it really looked like was more like this. But for the sake of this talk, let's keep it at the simple level. So what's going on here? Well, you have the data sources, and you ingest them, which gives you some input data in your analytical system, in our case, HDFS. And you're running some data processing on top of it, which gives you some intermediate results. And then you might, for example, run a differ to see which of these results are really relevant for production. And then you have final results, and you're exporting those results. And it was fine for the very first use case, but you can already see that some things are not optimal and that we quickly tried to tackle and fix. And that was you should always decouple data ingestion. So what I mean by that, um, you have here um, this flow, and it kind of makes sense. It was the first Hadoop flow that we've built. There was no data in the cluster, so the team who built the flow also built the data ingestion and just made it one, right? But that's not optimal. Let's say, for example, that one service is using Postgres as a database and the other is using MongoDB as a database. Then that should be really an implementation secret of that service. Your flow should not be concerned about that. And you should not have to implement connectors to all the different databases all over again. And worst case, be restricted in the choice of your processing framework, because one processing framework might have a connector for your favorite database, and the other might not. So um, 
for another thing, these imports are usually quite expensive, so you want to reuse them as much as possible. And one thing that surprised us a little bit um, was it is really hard to debug if you don't separate that. And this is what I want to explain a little bit more. So imagine you have written a job and you did all the things in the right way. So this means you have perfect unit tests and integrations tests, but still, suddenly, um, your job breaks on production, and then how are you uh, tackling this? How are you finding the root cause? And there are so many options. Is it a new constellation in your input data that you just never have seen before? Or is it a change on the cluster? Did someone uh, roll out a security fix or uh, change the configuration? Or is it a race condition that always was there, but this day is just the very first time that you've observed that race condition? And if you want to debug that root cause, you need to have some crucial operational capabilities. So it should be super easy to do ad hoc analysis of all the involved data. You, if you try to find out what the bug is, you want to be able to run statistics on your input data, on your intermediate results, and on your final results. Even more important, if the flow broke today, but it worked very well yesterday, what you want to be able to do is rerun with the current configuration of your cluster, with the current state of, of the world, rerun the same flow on yesterday's data, um, because with that, you can rule out that it's a data issue. And if you finally found and fixed the bug, you, and you have come up with a hot fix, you want to rerun it on today's data. But you want to run it on exactly the same data that um, the first iteration ran on, because that might have uh, triggered this, uh, the, might have less constellation. You want to know for sure that this is fixed, and you can sleep uh, well uh, during the next uh, night. So how do we decouple? I mean, we already said we don't want the flow to own the data ingestion. Some could now argue, well, if the database is an implementation secret of the service, the service should be responsible for pushing that information. And um, that's not what we decided for. So we decided for a dedicated data ingestion component. And so the advantage here is that batch flows don't have to have connectors for all the different uh, database technologies, but also that the services do not need to know about the different big data technology, which is currently on work and fast changing. And also, it allows you on a one central place to implement features like, hey, let's for everything that we ingest, let's always mount it to Hive, because that will allow the kind of ad hoc analytics. And it also allows then that data to be reused by many flows. OK. So the important thing, though, is if you have such a dedicated component, it needs to be generic. So every team who has a need to ingest a new data source should be able to get it ingested. So you don't want every request for data ingestion to be handled, handed over to a central data engineering team and sit there in the, uh, in the Jira board for a few weeks until that is done. You want every team to contribute to this uh, central platform data import. And every ingested data should immediately be available to other consumers as well, so that once you have done the work of integrating it, it should be available to any use case uh, with any framework and including analytics. And as we said before, if you have this um, dedicated component, you can easily have feature parity for all data sources, for example, mounting everything in Hive. So the next thing that we quickly realized is uh, the importance of speaking a common format. And what I mean with that is have at least one copy of all data in a common format. It's OK to have multiple formats, but you should always have this common ground. And formats at ResearchGate developed very, very quickly. When we started first, we used text, because that was what all the um, uh, hello world uh, and hello world in that case was word count uh, examples did, but it has low productivity, low performance, and it gave us a lot of bugs. So we very quickly ex uh, exchanged that with sequence files, 
which gave us better performance and fewer bugs, but awful developer productivity. And then we very, very quickly moved over to Avro, and that was really helpful. And it has an amazing set of features, if you really look into it, which you can build other integrational patterns on top of it. So the schema evolution is really nice. The fact that it's self-describing is amazing because it's trivial to mount an Avro data set into Hive, for example, and have full schema fidelity. Um, it has the Reflect Datum Reader, which is really, really underestimated, in my opinion. And it's flexible because of its robust nature. You can use it for both batch and streaming. So, but we didn't want to stop there. We wanted more. We wanted better performance, better compression. That's why we added OSC as an additional format. But we didn't drop the um, other one. So um, you, you can add additional formats that have specific features that are great for certain use cases, great for certain uh, frameworks, but uh, still keep this common ground format. So. Um, we think um, OSC is great for batch, and we would love every um, framework to support it. But that does not mean that we will drop Avro, because that is still this one thing that everyone understands, and uh, it's flexible for both batch and streaming. So have at least one copy of all data in a common format, which means your choice of processing framework should not be limited by the format of existing data. So if one team says, hey, we want to use this, and for that we are importing it in Parquet, that's totally fine, but still get the other one so that you can reuse the data in other use cases. Um, which means then every ingested source will be available for all consumers. And when optimizing for a framework, you consider a copy. The next one is a bit related. Um, that is, speak a common language. And what I mean by that is continuously propagate schema changes. And if we go back to our previous example, um, the question is, you have some databases which have an inherent schema and some databases which are schema-less. Do we now have structured or unstructured data? The thing is, just because the data is in MongoDB does not mean it's unstructured. For almost all of our use cases, the service knew, knows very well about the structure and knows exactly what that data looks like. And so this is something we are really interested in. And it goes a little bit to the data warehouse versus data lake argument. So, um, the classic data warehouse would mean you enforce a schema at ingestion time, you do this schema on write. But this means you have to maintain all this ETL stuff, all those transformations. And the data lake, in the classic sense, assumes no schema at all and basically defers this task of discovering the schema to the consumer. Now, we didn't really like both approaches because um, for the data warehouse, it's way too expensive to main all these transformation processes. And transformation does mean a potential loss of information, of, of, of data. So we didn't want to spend time on, on, on these transformations. We wanted to spend time on building great features. But just as well, we didn't like the data lake, the pure classic data lake approach, because losing schema information, which is already known in the service, is really bad, and different consumers have to rediscover the schema over and over and over again. And we don't have time for that, because we want to build great features in that time instead. So the question is, can we have both? And with both, I mean the best properties of both worlds, not the worst, of course. So, um, can we preserve the schema information that is already present, sometimes at database level, but in many times in our use case at the application level, while at the same time always preserve the full data, never lose data, be truthful to our data source? And by that meaning, can we always propagate schema changes that you have in your source of truth database? And the question is, can we have something like a data lake house, maybe? And it turns out we can. So what we did is we went for a code-first approach. So the service knows what the data looks like. And the service usually has entities which describe how that data looks like. And we 
want those entities to define the schema. And whenever a developer makes a change to those entities, then we know if we can get the schema information from there, we are always up to date. So we want to automatically con uh, convert uh, the schema which is inherent in the entities to an Avro schema. And that's possible. And actually, everyone is doing that already today. So almost everyone is having some annotations in the entities of their services for Jackson, for example, to say how this is converted to a JSON format. Or you have entities from your um, object document meta which tell you how are you going to put this into the database. And here, for example, you have a field. And in your favorite programming language, unfortunately, abstract is a reserved word, so you have to call it differently. But in different systems, you want to have it named properly. And um, so what we did, we implemented a few um, Avro and, um, and extra Avro annotations that make this really easy. Um, that's already a while ago. I think it went into Avro 175, so it's available to everyone. So we have Avro name, Avro ignore, Avro alias, Avro meta. And with that, we can automatically generate an Avro schema which has all that information. So um, we want to continuously propagate schema changes, which means we want to make our data ingestion process generic and driven by those Avro schemas, which means changes in the Avro schemas are continuously propagated to the data ingestion process. Whenever you deploy an updated version of the entities in production to your service, also update the Avro schema in the data ingestion process, which means, um, the, which means the data ingestion process now can be completely generic, and the way how to fetch it from the database is all encoded in, in this Avro schema in metadata. Um, it also then um, um, allows Avro schema evolution is a, is a really nice feature, it turned out, because you don't have to upgrade all consumers straight away. You can still have consumers out there, flows out there, which have the old schema deployed, and Avro schema evolution will usually do a very good job of uh, making your consumers read that data. Caveat is, of course, if you have a breaking change that is not covered by Avro schema resolution, you still have to um, deal with that with a change uh, management process. But the important thing that we get out of this is that everyone speaks the same language. And that was really surprising how much that affected the organization. Because the engineer who's building the service um, and providing, for example, the JSON API is talking about exactly the same fields as the engineers who are implementing the clients of these services. So um, uh, the engineers who are working with JavaScript, for example, they're also talking about exactly the same fields. And the engineers who are building the big data flows are talking about exactly the same f fields. And our product analysts, which are using, for example, Hive or IPython to do these analysis, also talk about the same fields. And this ease of communications between the company just um, reduces so many uh, potential friction and misunderstanding. So one of the biggest advantages of that approach, it turned out to be, was the improved communication within the organization. Uh, there was a small extra benefit that we did not immediately expect. It's also coming out of this combination of using Avro Reflect Reader and using entities, because if you have exactly the same schema in your live database as you have in your analytics system, then you can actually share code and share business logic. When would you do this? Imagine you want to make a stricter validation rule on your service then you, of course, can deploy that to production, but you want, what you want to find out is how many records will be affected by that. And you can take these uh, stricter um, uh, validation rules, just put it into a batch process, run it over all the data sets that you have in your Hadoop cluster, and then you can get statistics what this change will do, what this will mean for, for your data, um, and you can get this upfront. So, that was speaking a common language. One thing um, which, which turned out to be um, really a tricky one was modeling data dependencies explicitly. 
So we have split it up now. We have this um, explicit data ingestion process, but we're still not happy. Um, and we're still not happy because of that edge that is going from the, from the red box to the orange box, um, because this is still too tightly coupled. Um, what are the potential um, um, issues with that is, for example, you want a flow to start as early as possible, but you don't know how long the import will take. How we solve this is with introducing Memento, which is a system which can be used to publish data sets. So what happens? The ingestion process provides um, uh, all the data and puts it into HDFS. And only after it's done, it notifies and signals Memento that this data is really there. And um, the consumer can pull for Memento, and Memento, as soon as this data is published, will notify it, and then you, uh, the, the consumer can um, work with the data and read it. So I'm showing here um, the Men Memento version 2 API. This is still work in progress right now at ResearchGate. So you would publish metadata in the data ingestion process. For example, in this case, we're talking about the author's collection in our refined database. And you would say, hey, the type is HDFS, and uh, it's valid from basically yesterday. So it's from 2017 or 611, and was actually impl uh, imported uh, this morning uh, early on at 0042. And um, you're publishing that, and your consumer can then poll with a certain waiting time, and it can describe with a language the quality of the data that it wants to get. So you say, hey, I want this author's collection, and I require data from today, and I want it in the HDFS format. I want uh, just the files, the bare files, not the Hive uh, one. And, and what you get back is you get from Memento, as soon as this is published, the information where to find this, so you don't have to know about these HDFS paths. In theory, this could mean we can even switch completely the storage, like, hey, fetch this from a different cluster, fetch this from S3 instead. Um, and one important thing is you're getting a unique artifact ID. That's really important because you can then always refer back to that specific version of the data that you requested. So what this means, uh, more flexible scheduling. Run, uh, you can run flows as early as possible. Um, you can have multiple ingestion or processing attempts while at the very same time retain immutable data. So imagine something goes wrong with your data ingestion pipeline and you want to rerun it. Then you have to make a business decision. What do you do with all the flows that have already started? Do you want to keep them running with the old data uh, and only the new uh, flows pick up on the newer version of the data? If that is the case, if that is a decision, um, with the system you can do it. You just load another attempt, a better version of the data, and the old flows can still refer to the old data. Basically, they have repeatable read. And one very nice thing is it allows analysis of the dependency graph. So you can find out which data sets are used by what flow. Again, that helps a lot for the communication within the organization. So we're still not happy because uh, we still need to talk about decoupling export of results. So we have the system in place. We're talking to Memento for the ingestion but we are now not happy about that edge, about that edge here, which is about playing back the results. So um, first of all, um, you want to split your flows that it is very, very easy to skip this export thing. You should uh, model your flows in a way that you can run them side effect free. Why is that so? Imagine someone needs to install a security patch on the cluster. Then they might want to rerun the most critical flows to prove that the system is still working. But um, we have already exported our um, data for today, so we don't want to export it. Same thing, you have a new 
development version of your flow, and of course you test it with unit tests, of course you test it with integration tests, but if you're talking about big data, you have to also do this test run um, on real production data because there might always be a data constellation that you have not anticipated. And then you want to run a development version on production data, of course you don't want to export that. And what's important, every flow should do this in the same way so that there is no surprises. So if you have this kind of a dry run mode, make sure that you do it in a consistent fashion. So we split this up, but the other thing is we don't want uh, this uh, job to write to the database directly. This database should be owned by the service, only the service should write to it. And we have this small special requirement that I talked about in the beginning. And that requirement is uh, we are writing back to the same database that we have written from. So this means um, we, are the, we are computing, but while we are computing, the word is still turning. It might be that the result that we came up with is no longer compatible with the state of the world as it is right now, as it is a time of export. So instead, um, we want to throw those results back at the service, and what we experimented with and then turned out to be very successful is just make HTTP calls all the time. So pushing results via HTTP back to the service. What this means is that this export of results is just becoming a client to the service like any other clients. So this means it's it's much more, it feels much more natural for the service developer. Also, the service does not have to be aware of how do I read this data from HDFS, how do I read this data from Kafka. It gets it pushed just via HTTP. And the service can validate each individual result and check, hey, is this still plausible? Is this still, um, do I want to ingest this back into my life system at the current state of the world? And you can do this with plausibility checks, with business rules, or with optimistic uh, locking. And last but not least, it makes testing so much easier because it's so easy to just spin up a service um, and then on your developer notebook and then throw some HTTP calls against it and see how that behaves than to always have to put a file, for example, on your Hadoop cluster and then make it ingest from there. So that's really helpful for testing as well. So we came up with a component which turns Avro files into HTTP calls, and we want that to be part of the flow, but we want to, it to be a standardized component so that um, we have this small building block where we can uh, compose bigger solutions out of it. And this component treats every single record in the Avro file as an individual, and if there's one million entries in the Avro file, it will make one million HTTP calls out of it. It handles tracking of the progress. It basically treats these input files as a queue. And this also means you can stop this process at any point in time, so you can stop it, um, do some maintenance work, some operational work, and then resume it any time. It's also, because it's a standardized component, it allows us to have some standard features, like for every, with every um, HTTP request, send the batch flow which, from which this is originating. And what we can also do then is uh, the service can see, oh, this is not a call which is originating from a human user. This is a call which is uh, uh, coming from this batch flow. Um, I'm currently at my scaling limit. I don't want to auto-scale anymore. Um, I'll just send a back pressure signal, and th um, this component, Avro to HAP, will then handle the back pressure signals from the service. And this is my last one for today, model flow orchestration explicitly, and I'll make that a big, bit faster. So please consider using an execution system and pick the system of your choice. Whether this is Azkaban, or Luigi, or Airflow, or any of the others, pick the system of your choice, but don't stop there. This is the one point where you can most easily create a maintenance nightmare to come for your system. So you want to have extra standards here in place. Um, something like inject paths always from the outside. Don't construct them in your flow. Um, inject calculation dates always from the outside. Never call now in any of your batch flows. Consider it making it functionally pure. 
Um, inject configura configuration settings, never hard code something like, hey, this mapper needs four gigabyte of memory, and foresee that you need different settings for different environments because your developer notebook will have less RAM and less data than your dev environment, and the dev environment will have less RAM and less data than the production environment, and you don't want to raise, uh, waste resources on your developer notebook. And uh, this is for C different environmental uh, settings. So always think about ease of operations, um, uh, tuning of settings, and ease of upgrades. Now, I talked a, a lot about batch processing, and now you're probably thinking, hey, batch processing is so 2015. What about stream processing? And so let's look quickly at what kind of sources of streaming data we have at ResearchGate. So there are some services which have natively, which natively produce time series data, and we put this as Avro into Kafka. And then there are some other services whose native format is not so much uh, time series data, um, where the most natural representation of your data would, for example, be a graph. And of course, you can turn everything into time series data, I mean, look at the journal of your database, and you have every change in time series data, but it's not the most natural way. And so what I just said is exactly what we did. So we built Entity Conveyor, which is a system which looks at the database replication and looks at every change that's happening there and can put that into a Kafka queue. So what we can then do, we can have stream processors which uh, join that information, which subscribe to both native time series data and the time series data that we provide from any other source. And what we do is we write the results of that stream processor into a Kafka queue again. And as this was working out so well with the HTTP calls, what we decided to do is we decided to implement a component that we call MQCOM, which subscribes um, uh, to Kafka topics and con can convert those Kafka topics to HTTP calls and put them back to the service. And when you're thinking about it like this, we are going through the same patterns. We are going through the same principles again. We decouple data ingestion. We speak a common format. We want all the data to be available in Kafka. So we want all data to be available in Avro files for all batch stops. We want all data to be available in Kafka topics as well for our streaming jobs. And inside there, we want those records to be Avro. Then we want to speak a common language. So we are listening directly to the database. We want to retain this full information. So when we are changing the entities of our service, we are also letting Entity Conveyor know about that schema change. And um, we are decoupling the export of results and throwing um, 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 these back via HTTP to the services. So you can have a test version of the stream processor, which just writes to a different Kafka topic, and no one is listening to that. But you can then do some analysis on it afterwards. So um, then there's also a lot of um, execution-specific things, and those differ. So I fear we're running out of time. I'm not going into details with that one. But what you're seeing here is that almost all of the rules that we came up with batch systems also apply for our streaming systems. And if you looked carefully, you see one is missing. So what about number four, model data dependencies explicitly? That's something which we have not yet completely figured out for the streaming world, but we think about it and potentially put Kafka topics into Memento storing offsets of interest as decided by the producer there as well. And we hope that this will facilitate switching between incompatible versions of stream processors. So what I want to close this talk with here is um, you have this big data architecture, and it's involving. And of course, a stream processor is a very different thing than a batch processor. So they, ha they have special requirements. But at the same time, there's a lot of reuse if um, you think about, uh, about these building blocks and about these patterns early on. And what I like to encourage you to think about is that there is not this batch camp and that there is this streaming camp and then there is no connection between them. Actually, we think that they are going very, very well together and uh, you should be able to just do both as needed by your use case. So that's about it. 
thank you so much for your attention. Um, do you have any questions? There's one here. So what were the factors that made you create Memento instead of using the existing workflow managers? So um, what we had in the very beginning, we tried to model the data dependency between two different flows as an Azkaban edge, which led to a horri horrifi yeah, horrifically huge graph that no one could look at anymore, and it entangled this to one unit of deployment. What you want is if you're running hundreds of flows with thousands of jobs, you want that one team can safely deploy just one flow, yeah, and know that it affects only them. If you try to model that with this, uh, with for example an Azkaban edge, then you always have this monolithic flow which describes all the data dependencies in your company, and that was just too entangled and too uh, strictly coupled. I see. Um, companies use Luigi and Airflow to do what you describe. Uh, could you? Uh so Imagine what you were not satisfied with those tools. So we, we built this before Luigi and Airflow was out. So that's a short answer. When? So um, we started building this in 2000. Can you help me, Curl? In 2013, 2014. So basically, it was development. I'm sure that other people have come up with the same uh, problem and come up with their, uh, um, with their solution for that. What I'm saying here is not that you should all now use Memento from now on. What I'm saying is model your data dependencies explicitly and really think about that, how you model them. And think about units of deployment. You don't want one huge monolithic configuration which describes that. All right, uh, let's take remaining questions offline. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you so much.